Hi, so fluency in the language of music is something we can learn just as naturally as we learn to be fluent in the language of words, in our native, in our native language that we speak and read and write. Now, I really believe this, but there's a sort of issue here, isn't it? If, if it's as easy and as natural as becoming fluent in, in language, why is musical fluency not more common? Well, that's what I'm going to look at in this video. I'm going to explore these, but let's start off by looking at, at why I believe so firmly that musical fluency is something that has its, its basis naturally inside all of us. So I believe that we all have an inner musician, which we sort of established basic sort of core skills of musical understanding that we established as very young children. Um, let me sort of try and prove it to you. If I play you something, I want you to listen to it and notice, just simply notice that you, you understand it. You understand the rhythm, you understand the tonality, the harmony, the melodies. You can hear it, you understand it. So I deliberately did some particularly tonal things, not so much rhythmic things, but tonal things that might be a bit complex, a bit chromatic, a bit strange. But notice you weren't thrown by anything, you understood it. Now you understood it kind of intuitively, that's the point. Um, you didn't understand it because you'd heard it before, because I was obviously, I say obviously, I was improvising that. Uh, I didn't, I've never heard it before either, I'm just, sort of speaking through the language of music, just like I'm speaking to you now through the language of words. I've not said these words exactly like this before to you, as far as I'm aware. Um, I'm just delivering a message from inside myself. So that's what I was doing. I was simply playing something spontaneously, improvising, extemporizing. So I'd never heard it before, you'd never heard it before, but of course we all understood the rhythm and the, the tonality of the music as it unfolded. And you didn't need to understand it theoretically to do that, and neither did I, although I could analyze it theoretically because I, you know, I've developed those skills as well. Those skills are not fluent skills, not, not for me. Uh, and I would challenge probably not for anybody. So we don't need to have heard it before. We don't need to understand the theory that it's made of. And yet we still understand it. How about this? If I play you something like this, if I go like this, I'm going to play this same little extract twice. Okay, that was the first one. Here's the second one. You don't need me to tell you which was the better one. You you understand what makes musical performance sound good. Now, again, that's not because you necessarily understand what the difference is. You, you might make some comments. Those comments could be true up to a point. But why was the second one good rhythm and what made it make more sense musically? You don't need to know that to know that it does. And I think that also proves that you have an inner musician that intuitively understands music. Of course, I would say it's kind of almost impossible to deny. I think the other 
thing that, that crops up again and again that I'm always trying to challenge is this idea that to be fluent, you have to process all the notes and intervals and, and stuff like that. So you need a sort of kind of perfect or absolute pitch. First of all, that's bypassing the most important part of musical fluency, which is rhythm. Um, so I get very impatient with this, if I'm honest. Perfect pitch is not... Well, it's something that we all have. It's just not a thing. We all have perfect pitch. Imagine if you, you knew that piece so well that you... Because it's always, you know, that piece, it's a Mozart sonata. It's always in, in, in the key of F, F major. So, you you know, you know it so well that you can hear... Maybe you have a, a record of it uh, uh, of your own and you can hear that playing in your head. You can, you can imagine it. You know it that well. Like we know certain songs and pieces really well. So you know that piece really well. You always hear it. You always hear it in that key, you don't suddenly hear it in this key. Do you see what I mean? It's like we all have perfect pitch in that sense. It's just that we have to learn to tag, I use this word tag, tag, recognise deeply, know, be able to, you know, um, summon on demand. So to, to really tag, to, to really know, the right things. If, if, if all we know are pieces, whole pieces of music, this is what I call the kind of karaoke mentality, if all we know are complete, complete pieces of music and tag those, that's not going to make us have a useful musical vocabulary. It's a bit like only being able to recite um, poems in a language in their complete form rather than hold a conversation. So obviously we need a vocabulary, but that vocabulary isn't isn't notes. We don't need perfect pitch and it isn't intervals or chords or anything theoretical like that. Every time you go to a concert or put put a put a record on, you are using your inner musician and you understand it. So what happens? Well, <laughs> I think what happens is speech, language, spoken language, words, hijacks music. The realm of language becomes very dominant very quickly. Children are really encouraged to speak. They're encouraged to express themselves verbally. In other words, they're encouraged to express themselves in a, a reasoned, logical way, a more adult way, perhaps you could say, than, than the pure feeling realm of, of music. So language is really encouraged. But did you know, um, with a moment's reflection, I'm sure you will see that this is true. Did you know that music is an inherent part of language and it kind of precedes it? So as I'm speaking to you now, I'm using rhythm and intonation. My voice goes up sometimes and it goes down sometimes and sometimes it kind of weaves around. That's intonation. Rhythm, da -da, rhythm is part of language. The trouble is that the kind of rhythms and the kind of tonal shapes that we speak with are not, well they're very sort of complex and subtle and and not really that musical. We need a bit of more of a groove, a bit more regularity. It's a bit like when we when we we create poetry out of words, we put it into a, a meter or a groove, and that's what gives it its poetic aspect. We, in other words, we we accentuate the music more, probably in the way that poetry is read, it becomes more musical. You see what I mean? So, so music is part of language. It underpins language. And it, maybe it's an expressive part of language that is in many ways greater than the words on their own. Just changing the music changes the meaning. If I say to you, I just want you to be happy, that means something very different from, well, I just want you to be happy. Okay, so there was body language and stuff as well, but you can hear there's a different music in the way I say it. So, so music is part of language, but poetry is more musical and music needs to go even further. Music has to have this sense of groove and sort of tonal structure. And that, that feeling of groove and tonal structure comes from the body and soul. So let's see if I can demonstrate that. Um, if I play speech rhythms, I'll just, I'll just, pl I'll just play as I'm speaking to you now and see what it sounds like. Not really very musical. Well, there is music that sounds like this, isn't there? There is. Very modern, very modern music. And that even, even there, doing that, it's making me be more poetic and more musical than I am being right now, and I've stopped doing it. So 
<laughs> the way that, that tonality and rhythm sounds in speech is not the same as the way it sounds in music. So, so it has to be in a way more childlike, more like a nursery rhyme. Ba ba black sheep, have you any wool? That kind of feeling. So you can hear that when it has groove and tonal structure, then it becomes obviously a lot more musical. But but speech does have the music deep, deeply buried inside it, but we're unconscious of using music. And I think this is a problem. It means that our way of processing music becomes very unconscious and very much linked with speech. A lot of people can obviously sing a song uh, in a karaoke fashion, albeit musically usually very approximate, um, rhythmically and tonally, that is, approximate. Um, nevertheless, they can sort of hold a tune, and it's almost because it's a bit like speech. Music becomes a bit like speech. Music came before speech, so music is not like speech. Music is something up upon which we build speech. So, and... <laughs> recovering that, recovering our, our, our sense of music, you know, it's it's not as easy as you might think. It takes a certain degree of uh, unblocking and maybe even some courage to do that. And we'll, we'll look at those reasons why blockages form. So in a way, the, the speech itself is kind of a blockage to fluency. Um, but there are deeper blockages in some ways, perhaps, than, than even that. I think we all suffer some kind of, uh, I don't know, emotional trauma around being children. Children, children who are very expressive and make a lot of noise and sort of express themselves musically, if you like, maybe theatrically, maybe dramatically as well, maybe through dance. You know, children who are how lively and expressive, are often crushed a little bit by the adults around them. Those adults in, you know, were probably crushed when they were children and so on, so it gets handed down. Uh, so children are not really encouraged to be as expressive musically as they would naturally be. And this is traumatising. And it can start to create all kinds of disempowering beliefs and fears, fears of expressing our feelings. So let's think about what language expresses and what music expresses. Music expresses feelings. Um, and feelings in our culture maybe are associated with being childish, perhaps. To, to, to be constantly, you know, pouring out your, your heart and soul. We're encouraged to be more grown up and to censor what we say and make it sound more reasonable and, and you know, not embarrassing and full of feeling. So you can see what kind of happens because in order to be a fluent musician, you have to actually express something. Fluency is dependent on that. You've got to commute on that. You've got to communicate something. So right now I'm communicating reasonable ideas. That's what language does. When I'm communicating through music, it's not reasonable ideas, it's pure feeling. And so for me to be a flute musician, I've got to be able to switch off that internal sensor and overcome, therefore, any traumas that I, I might have. And I certainly do have some, but I did actually rebel against them. At nine years old, I decided that I was, you know, I was going to be musical. I have various techniques to try and help people do this. One of my favourites to get people to free up and be musical is to really work on rhythm first. Rhythm comes first. Rhythm is the basis of musicianship, really. Tonality is built on top of rhythm. So I get people to, to feel a groove, a really strong groove in their body, and make up a kind of, like almost like a nursery rhyme type of uh, rhythmic structure, a tonally just all over the keys. And it takes a lot of freeing up to do this. Something like this. Notice that feeling of groove, that 
that that structural thing, that rhythmic thing that's at the basis of of all music. We, do, we just, you don't have to have a an actual audible beat. You don't have to have drums playing the groove. There's, there is a groove in music that that binds it together. It can be very flexible. You can be it can be more poetic, where it sort of goes da da ti da di da ti da, and we call that tempo rubato when the, when the, there's a flexibility to the groove. But groove needs to be there for us to have this this musical quality. And that's, it's through the groove that we start to tell the musical story. I was sort of telling a story. This is actually quite hard for a lot of adults to do. Not so hard for children. Um, one of the things that people sometimes say to me to challenge what I teach, musical fluency, they'll say, but surely you have to be a child. It's only children, pre-five-year-old children specifically, uh, that can develop these kinds of skills. Now, obviously, I think there's truth in that, but I think we just have to, get into the mentality of a pre-five child. We have to have four-year-old, a four-year-old mind to learn to be fluent. I was actually, I had some degree of fluency when I was very little, I'll admit that, but then remember I'm saying that we all do anyway. It just tends to be rather passive. But it wasn't very developed. By the age of nine, I was already starting to go very passive. I had the traditional teaching um, system being taught to me. So so I rebelled against that. And at nine years old, which is not pre-five, it's nine, you know, it's a, moving towards being an adult mind at nine years old. I rebelled and I deliberately entered the, the mind of a four-year-old. Uh, I recovered my inner, my inner four-year-old musicality. And I did that very defiantly because I didn't really like all the scales and fingering and all the strictness that my teacher was giving me. I felt it was kind of spoiling my enjoyment of music. It was making pieces that I really liked when I first heard them sound boring when I'd practiced them in that kind of repetitive rehearsing practice way that he, he made me do, learning them hand separately and with a metronome and thinking about technique and all this stuff. It was destroying it. It was just destroying the joy of, of playing the piano for me. So I rebelled against it and this is what I did. I, I recovered my inner four-year-old and if you like found my groove. And it's so important that we find our groove, this childlike state, like a nursery rhyme, like a child's poem, like a limerick. Da 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 It's got to feel playful. Music's got to have that quality. Even if it's full of pathos, it still has this groove and this sense of structure upon which we then build everything, including tonality. So you have to have the mind of a child. You have to ex to express feelings, to express stuff that perhaps when we were children, most of us were told we, we couldn't express, that we needed to be good and quiet and learn to talk reasonably. Now, of course, the blockage that I was just talking about, and there are, there is a, there's a lot more to, to the blockages in music than just that. I, I think everyone has their own individual kind of mix of blockages, and I, I go into that a lot as a teacher. I make I make sure that part of the course that I, I offer, the teaching that I offer is to some degree a kind of coaching um, offering that helps people unblock. And everybody, as I say, has their own unique blockages. But that particular block, the, the kind of expressive block that I was just talking about is pretty universal. The other one is, of course, a cultural blockage. So what do I mean? Well, I mean the way music is taught in our culture. It's not taught the way I teach. It's not, we're not taught to be fluent. We're taught to either do karaoke, which is what I mean by that is we know how it goes. We repeat it, we rehearse it until the muscle memory kicks in. Once we get that mechanical memory, we can, we can play it passively. This is not fluency. This would be like me learning a poem in Russian, even though I can't speak Russian, but I'd learn it because I'd learn how it sounds. And I could even sort of know what it means, but it's not fluency, is it? It's only fluency if, if I really understand the words and the structure of the words. So we use that sort of karaoke muscle memory approach or we do an awful lot of theoretical processing, which would be like suggesting that right now as I'm speaking to you, I'm analyzing my sentences in terms of the grammar, the, the you know, the subject and object, the, the verbs, any clauses, maybe those clauses might be gerundival, are they time or space clauses? We don't think like that. I think actually theory goes a bit deeper th than that into the realm of mental gymnastics because I actually think that it's a bit like doing anagrams in your head or something like that, like word games. Now, I, I, I'm pretty fluent with language, I think, um, but I'm not very good at word games. You know, you're not going to catch me solving anagrams um, very well. So 
obviously we don't need to have theoretical understanding to, to be fluent, but that's what we are taught. So we're taught to understand a melody like this. It's very, it's sort of like straight lines, it's linear, it's top down. So here's a little melody. So we go, okay, it starts with, uh, you know, quarter note, quarter note, quarter note, a couple of eighth notes, eighth, eighth, and then another quarter, another quarter, and then a, a half note at the end. Crikey. And then we have to think of it as like a perfect fifth going up. And then it repeats in the same place, comes down a, a major second, a minor second, another major second, back up a major second, and then down a major third. Or something like that. That's not actually how you process melody. If I play that melody like this... ...more expressively, more fluently, you can hear that that melody contains harmony. There it is. And then you hear a... ...a sense of a new harmony, and then back to the... ...the first harmony. We sense that very, very naturally. That's really how we make sense of music. So that's much more complex because what you're hearing is that block, that block of harmony that spreads, you know, right across the whole range of, of your, your human hearing, the whole range of the keyboard. But that's an auxiliary note. It's not actually in the block. It's between and it wants to resolve. It can resolve up as well. So that one is an auxiliary note, it resolves. Another auxiliary note. Yeah, that's in the block. That's an auxiliary note, and then back to the block. So it's complex, isn't it? So we have to build it up very steadily. We don't think about this stuff consciously or theoretically when we're doing it. We just know the vocabulary, and our vocabulary is not sort of top-down, let's analyse it, it's deep structures, you're hearing the rhythm. The rhythm is dum, 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 diddle, dum, dum, dum. So we think in terms of rhythm cells plugged into a groove. We think in terms of blocks of harmony that are also plugged into that, that groove, that structure. And it's based on simple and, of course, natural skills but it, music does become very complex. We don't start with the complexity and analyse it. That, that doesn't work, but we're taught to do that. And what I'm saying is that thinking that music is like that, that music is a top-down, very complicated set of code, lots and lots of codified data that you're supposed to be able to process in real time when nobody's brain has got the processing power to really do that, that's very, that's very intimidating and very blocking. I mean, even just sight reading a score, looking at a score and trying to sight read every individual note, it would be a bit like me giving you some text and saying you've got to process it in terms of every single letter. I mean, let alone listening to me speaking, you know you're not processing the letters, you're processing the words. So what, are, what is the musical vocabulary? Well, as I say, it's rhythm cells in a groove and a sort of matrix of harmonic blocks that plug into the map of your instrument. So that's what we, we understand. So it's a simple model, but it, it, you, we build it up through practice, through expressing ourselves, we build it up into all the complexity that we know music has. So if I just go back for a second to this idea of the biggest blockage to fluency being, how shall I put it, fear of expressive exposure. You know what I mean? It's like, I've got to actually express my inner feelings to be a fluent musician, because otherwise, what am I expressing? All I'm doing is mimicking that performance. I'm not expressing something from within me, so it's not fluent. If I, was, if I rehearsed these words and said them to you mechanically, I don't have to mean them, but then you would, you'd be able to tell. You know, you, you would know. Um, so I think a lot of the music that we hear these days is, is kind, kind of more cool. I call it clever, quirky, cool music that, that isn't necessarily all that personally expressive. Um, so to become fluent, you kind of got to get past all, all of that cultural stuff, the theory stuff I was just talking about, this idea of being cool and making a good performance that sounds cool and together and, you know, yeah, kind of not embarrassing. <laughs> we have to face our embarrassment, face our expressive exposure fears, become a bit childlike. 
and stop thinking that being childlike is being childish. So we ha that's very important. That's our biggest that's our biggest challenge really to 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 play in that way. And I want you to just consider that what that requires is an is some something that we have to do and that thing that is hard to do but this is what I teach is that we have to let go in other words in other words we have to trust our inner musician we have to trust our body and soul and stop listening critically thinking about the future thinking about the past stop planning stop hearing what we've done just express in the moment is this a childish sort of thing to do well I don't know it's kind of childlike if I'm being really dramatic I, meant, I, did, I showed you the, the kind of eternal improvising. If I put some tonality in and really be dramatic, this is a very good way to practice. It's not really difficult doing that. That's why I showed you the sort of atonal thing first. I could choose any block, the three notes in a harmonic block, and I could deliver that with lots of rhythmic storytelling, that childlike, poetic, groovy storytelling. Go. Really let go and, and tell that story. This is hard to do. This is if if it were if this were easy to do. If this weren't something that gets blocked, I think fluency would be common because music musicality and musicianship is is something natural. So it's inside us. But people don't let go, and I've I've taught people that literally can't let go. I'll be honest with you. I have taught people, and I've unfortunately had to call it a day sometimes and think, yeah, this person simply can't do it. All they can do is try and create an impressive performance. You have to express yourself, not impress yourself, to be fluent. You have to be saying something. And as I keep saying, what music says is something that feels quite childish to us if we're conditioned, as most of us are, to be firmly residing in the realm of language and reason. So letting go, letting go being, trusting our body and soul, trusting that we have within us a natural musician that doesn't need to be executively controlled with technique and fingering and all this stuff. It's very hard to do, especially given the cultural stuff, as I mentioned, that this is how music is taught. It's taught with theory. It's also taught with lots of mechanical control, isn't it? That's part of that cultural thing, which I should have mentioned, really. It's not just theory, is it? It's also a lot of technical and mechanical control. How do we physically execute the task of, of playing music on an instrument or singing. Um, and this is a lot of top-down thinking that, that stops us from being, being just freely expressive. So letting go is difficult. I have to let go of all that cultural stuff, all that individual traumatic blockage. For some people, it just it's just too much. I get that. They can't do it. They aren't willing to do it. It feels unsafe. For the rest of us, if we can face that and really take on that we have this childlike inner musician that really wants to express itself, the rewards are incredible. It feel, playing music from the body and soul, I can tell you, is, well, it's the best thing. It, it feels good. It feels really, really good. So to help us let go, because as I say, letting go is not easy for most of us, what I did for myself and what I offer my students is a model, a model of how music works, a nice, simple, common sense model. It's very distilled. I think fluency in the past in sort of pre-agricultural society, I, I imagine people were very fluent musically. They communicated together with music, but their vernacular was probably more limited. So they didn't need such a distilled model, but we need one now. Um, and it works. It's a simple model of rhythm cells plugged into a groove structure groove or rhythmic matrix and tonal blocks especially harmonic blocks plugged into a kind of tonal matrix which is your map your map of your instruments in this case the, the keyboard map now we need a distilled model as i say because music now is we live in such a melting pot global village and all that technological era we hear music of so many different styles so it doesn't matter if i play something like this if I play something like this. It, 
it doesn't make any difference. The vernacular is different, but the basic vocabulary, the basic sort of model of music that I'm using is identical. And I think it probably would work for any kind of music, as far as I can tell. Um, so focus, you focus on this model moment by moment. That in itself is, is challenging for some people, just to, just to focus rather than to evaluate and think and work out and, you know, think in that sort of um, theoretical way. So in a way that's purely observing, like a kind of meditative state rather than a cognitive state, you're just observing, saying, oh, look, there's a rhythm cell, it's that rhythm cell, it's that tonal block, just watching them go by. I'm there in the structure of the groove. I'm here in the structure of the keyboard map. So simple observation, pure focus, which is a challenge, as I say. Um, but actually, it's also a challenge to focus and let go, because when you're focusing, it's kind of, you know, your cortical brain, the, the cortex is involved, it's very calm, it's very clear. When you let go, it's probably deeper, more primitive brain structures that are really, you know, expressing and feeling. So that's looking at it in a, a neuroscience way for a moment. So, it, yeah, it, it's not necessarily easy to focus and let go. It's maybe easy to focus maybe easy to let go, but doing them at the same time requires practice. And practice, of course, is the key. Practicing in that state of focus and let go, that state of flow, as I like to think of it, is the key. And it's not easy. It's not easy to, to achieve. I'll talk about the state of flow a lot more in future videos because I think it's very, very important getting into the right zone. Um, I'll be honest, some people, as I say, don't manage to let go but I honestly believe that if we really challenge ourselves and find that focus if the desire is strong enough to really express like a child to really feel that freedom and we are willing to take on this this task this skill of focusing at the same time as, as being free and expressing ourselves we can do it and it feels so good at the risk of sounding like I'm selling it it's the best feeling ever playing music fluently, improvising, and having that expressive freedom and the clarity at the same time. Obviously, as I say, you're, you're not impressing yourself, you're just expressing yourself. So at no point do I kind of go, you know, passively, like as an audience member, oh, look at me playing the piano. It's always just simply like I am now just simply telling you something. But it feels so good and it is doable, but it is challenging. So it takes some courage, it takes a bit of digging deep inside. If you're prepared to do that, you can become musically fluent because it is natural. <laughs>